Chrysler-built 100-ampere alternator is used primarily on 75 intermediate and full-size passenger models equipped with the electric rear window defroster. This alternator is standard on all 75 police and taxi models, regardless of engine or other optional equipment. The new 1.8 horsepower starter motor is standard equipment on all 75 model 360, 400, and 440 V8s. It is not available with a 225.6 or 318 V8 engine. A quick look at a typical 100 ampere charging system shows several differences from earlier systems. Note that the alternator cooling fan here is external. A point to remember when working nearby with the engine running. Another difference can be seen at the alternator mounting points, which have rubber bushings to dampen mechanical vibration and reduce audible noise. These rubber bushings also isolate the alternator from the engine electrically, so an extra wire is added to the harness to provide a ground return circuit for the alternator housing. The electronic voltage regulator appears essentially unchanged from other models. However, in this unit, the temperature compensating characteristics are designed to follow the battery charging requirements more closely. Increasing output for ample charging when operating at low temperatures. Decreasing the output during high temperature operation to prevent overcharging. A new field loads relay is added in this system to reduce circuit resistance between the voltage regulator and the battery. The relay points close the field circuit only when the ignition switch is in the run position. This arrangement makes the regulator more sensitive to battery charging requirements and disconnects some non-essential loads to make starting easier, especially in cold weather. The field loads relay is also used with lower capacity charging systems in all but our compact models. Now, a few quick notes about testing before we get inside the alternator itself. As described in the service manual, checking the charging system performance on the vehicle remains generally unchanged. The electronic voltage regulator tester is also used in the same manner as before, but a new plug-in adapter is added to the tester cable connector. By moving the adapter selector switch to the appropriate position, you can test all 75 and previous model electronic voltage regulators with the same basic test instrument. Testing the field loads relay is also simple. First of all, if the blower can be operated when the ignition switch is in the run position, you know that the relay contacts are closing. However, a no charge, no blower condition with the engine running can be caused by no relay input from the ignition switch, trouble in the relay itself, or by faulty wiring. You can make a quick check of relay input and relay response with the ignition switch in the run position. Pull off the input wiring connector, and then, as you reconnect it, listen for a closing thump in the relay. If the relay does not respond, again, remove the input wiring connector and use a test lamp to check for available voltage across the terminal. If the lamp lights, it means that the input is okay and the trouble is in the relay. Relay operation, as well as alternator field and field circuit condition, can also be checked at the voltage regulator connector terminals. We make this test with the ignition switch in the run position, engine stopped, blower turned off, and the connector unplugged. The indication at both connector terminals should be the same as battery voltage. If the reading at either terminal is lower than battery voltage or zero, check the relay and all parts of the relay circuit, field circuit, and ignition run circuit for opens, shorts, or high resistance. Now we're ready for a closer look at the new Chrysler-built 100 ampere alternator. And since the main features of this alternator are similar to those of previous models, we'll only review servicing highlights here. To prevent damage in disassembly, first remove the brush holder assembly. Note that the brushes and rotor slip rings are side by side in this model. Remove the housing through bolt. And at the slots provided, pry the drive section loose from the stator, leaving the stator and rectifier section together. Do not try to pry the stator away from the end shield without disconnecting the stator lead terminals. Six positive rectifier diodes are mounted on the lower heat sink and connect to terminal block studs with short straps. 
The six negative diodes are similarly mounted on the upper heat sink and also have strap connectors. Both rectifier assemblies can be checked with the stator removed or in place by using the rectifier tester. Be sure that the housing assembly is on an insulated surface when testing. When testing the positive rectifier assembly, the tester clip is connected to the alternator output terminal. And the probe is touched to each positive diode connecting strap in turn. The pointer should move in the same direction and read approximately the same amount at each diode strap. The negative rectifier assembly test is made at each diode strap in the same manner as the positive, except that the tester clip connects to the ground terminal. The readings, of course, will be on the opposite side of the tester scale. Further procedures for checking rectifier diodes and for testing stator windings, the rotor field coil, and other components are described in the service manual, so we'll omit them here. The drive pulley and bearing are removed with the same puller tool. For pulley removal, the spacer block of the puller is placed in its narrow position. With the pulley off the shaft, remove the bearing retainer screws and tap the drive end of the rotor shaft to separate the bearing and rotor assembly from the end shield. To remove the bearing, the puller spacer block must be placed in its wide position. Remove the bearing spacer ring if it is to be transferred to a replacement rotor. The slip ring assembly in this model is not serviced separately. If the assembly is badly worn or damaged, the complete rotor must be replaced. The plastic grease retainer, however, can be pried off if replacement is needed. Install a new grease retainer by pressing it on the rotor shaft with a retainer installer tool. The retainer is properly positioned when the tool bottoms on the end of the rotor shaft. The rectifier end shield needle bearing can be removed or replaced with the rectifier assemblies in place. For removal, position the special tool parts and the end shield as shown and press out the bearing. To install a new needle bearing, slip it on the end of the installing tool base. Then align the end shield, interface down, so it can be pressed onto the bearing until the end shield contacts the press bed. This positions the bearing to provide the correct clearance between the bearing and the grease retainer on the rotor shaft. To install the drive end bearing, first seat the bearing in the end shield and install the bearing retainer parts. Support the slip ring end of the rotor shaft on the press bed. With the bearing spacer installed, position the shield and bearing assembly squarely on the drive end of the shaft. Then hold the installing tool in place on the bearing hub and press the assembly onto the shaft until the hub contacts the spacer. Remove the installing tool and start the pulley on the shaft. Again, support the slippering end of the rotor shaft to protect the bearing and press the pulley on until it contacts the drive bearing hub. Do not, under any circumstances, attempt to drive the pulley on by hammering. When reassembling the alternator, torque the through bolts evenly 40 to 60 inch pounds. Also make sure that the brush holder is properly seated before tightening the attaching screw. As a closing note on the 100 ampere alternator, remember to loosen the mounting pivot bolt before adjusting belt tension. If the bolt is tight when you move the alternator, it will set up an unwanted torsion load in the rubber bushings. The new 1.8 horsepower starter motor is similar to the previous 1.5 horsepower model, except that it's slightly larger for more power has a 2 to 1 instead of a 3.5 to 1 gear ratio for more cranking speed, and is equipped with a shock absorber type clutch for parts protection. Here, as in the alternator, there is much that is unchanged, so we'll limit our coverage to the new features and servicing highlights. Except for the relatively low numerical ratio, the gearing is essentially the same as in other Chrysler-built starting motors. The same special tool set specified for replacing the gear shaft bushings in other models can be used here. The clutch incorporates three rubber cushions, 
in a two-section drive hub. These cushions allow radial movement between the pinion shaft and the clutch to help prevent backfire-caused reversals from damaging the clutch or chipping drive pinion or flywheel teeth. The shock-absorbing clutch is serviced as a complete assembly. This clutch can be installed in other models as a replacement for the solid-type clutch, but a wider shifter fork must also be used. The solenoid lead wire on the brush terminal can be disconnected by simply unwrapping the wire. However, when it's reconnected, the wire must be tightly rewrapped and secured with high temperature solder. Before assembling the field frame to the brush plate, make sure that the brush solenoid lead terminal is positioned to clear the field coils and replace the insulator sleeve. The brush support plate and brushes are serviced as an assembly. However, the battery terminal contact can be serviced separately. Note that the correct assembly for this starter has green colored brush lead insulation. And there you have the features and servicing highlights of our new 100 ampere alternator and 1.8 horsepower starter motor. You will find additional information on both in your reference books and be sure to review the complete service and overhaul coverage in the service manual.